John, who is not concerned with the story of Jesus being born as a baby in Bethlehem, but takes this to the beginning of all things. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What was come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, as the glory as a, a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This is the one of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is only God, it is God the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. I'll read that last line again since I sort of messed that up. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Time's an interesting thing, isn't it, around Christmas? I passed trees on the curb ready to be picked up by the trash this morning on my way here. And also yesterday, as I watched a movie, I counted 17 different commercials for weight loss. There was Jenny Craig and... Nutrisystem, and my favorite, WW, which used to be called Weight Watchers, but that's apparently too formidable for people, so now it's the WW plan. And Noom, don't forget Noom. 17 different weight loss commercials in one movie. Shows where we are, doesn't it? We're at the point in the Christmas celebration where it's time to tighten our belts literally as well as figuratively as those credit card bills start rolling in from the money we spent on Christmas. Christmas does sort of tie us to time, doesn't it? It's a nostalgic time, not just theologically. We don't just look back to the birth of Jesus, our Lord. We look back to our own celebrations as children. How many of you spent time watching the movies that sort of make it Christmas for you? Whether that be a Charlie Brown Christmas or The Grinch or The Christmas Carol, the best one being the one with Alistair Sim in black and white, of course. But there are all sorts of different movies that take us back to childhood, just as cookies and candies and treats take us back to childhood. Whether you liked it or not, you sometimes make the dish your mother made because it reminds you so much of her and your time together with her. So here we are this morning at the beginning of a new year. New Year's Eve has always surprised me that people put so much stock in one minute being one year and one minute being the next year and having someone to have to kiss and being out and celebrating in the streets. Because really, if you look at it, it's sort of like weight loss. People tell me, it would take me so long to lose weight, I'll never want to do it. To which I reply, you know, that time's going to pass whether you're on a diet or whether you're gaining more weight. So here we are at the beginning of a new year with passages that take us to the beginning of all things. Jesus Christ, the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, capital W, the Logos of God. The very breath that God utters and light comes into being at the beginning of all things. Not the beginning of God, however, because God pre-exists before we can even give any thought to that. I remember being with the kids in our preschool back in July when they did Christmas in July, and we were downstairs. We were filming for Vacation Bible School. We were filming one of our little videos, but the kids were there, and John McGuckin was there in his Santa suit, and then he changed over to be Mordecai for us in our little drama that we videotaped, but... One of the kids said to me, Pastor Terry, I know Christmas is Jesus' birthday. When is God's birthday? That was our little theologian, Wesley, and I said, nobody knows because God was not born. God has always been and always will be. That's the message that I want you to take this morning, that God, who always has been, always will be. Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come, is with us through the power of his Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is not just some disembodied 
thing that we talk about. It's a person, and it is the spirit not just of God, but of Jesus Christ himself who will be with us no matter what we face. He is here. And I think on a morning like this when I'm preaching to a nearly empty sanctuary other than our, God bless them, our very faithful crew who comes here to make sure that you can worship with us no matter what happens in the world. As we are here together, we're joined in heart and we will be here again because God is faithful. Those are the passages we read this morning. This is a lesson series that is in the lectionary and only comes up every few years because it's not often that we have such a long period between Christmas and Lent. Lent this year doesn't begin until the month of March. It's always usually in the middle of February. We have a longer time this year to look at Christmas and to look at next Sunday when we study the epiphany of our Lord. And the weeks after the epiphany, when we talk about the light coming into the world, we are taken all the way back again to God who created light. And Jesus Christ is light, and in him is the life of all people, and no darkness can overcome the love of God. No darkness can overcome the grace of God. No light can overcome, no darkness can overcome the light that is ours in Jesus Christ. So we read from Jeremiah this morning. If you remember just a few weeks ago, I read from Jeremiah the passage where as the exile is beginning, he goes out and he buys land in the middle of ground zero. He goes out and makes a profession of his faith and the hope and the restoration of God. And today in Jeremiah, he proclaims that God is going to lead the people home, the blind, the lame, those with child, those who have suffered greatly. God is still with them, has always been with them, and will lead them to new pastures and to back to the land of promise. In Ephesians, we see again that God, who has been with us from the beginning of all things, will be with us always. And the passage we just read from John, which is one of those theological passages that is hard to understand, can be summarized by saying, from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. In the past we had the law, now we have the grace and the presence of God given to us in a fragile human infant. I want to read to you a little bit of what Martin Luther said Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther, the reformer in Germany, the one who brought about the Protestant Reformation. This is what he says. See how God invites you in many ways. He places before you a babe with whom you may take refuge. You cannot fear him, for nothing is more appealing to a person than a babe. Are you afraid? Then come to him lying in the lap of the fairest and sweetest maid. You will see how great is the divine goodness, which seeks above all else that you should not despair. Trust him. Trust him. Here is the child in whom is salvation. To me, there is no greater consolation given to humankind than this, that Christ became human, a child, a babe, playing in the lap of his most gracious mother. Who is there whom this sight would not comfort? Now has overcome the power of sin, death, hell, conscience, and guilt. If you come to see this gurgling babe and believe that he is come, not to judge you, but to save. When John's gospel says, he became flesh and dwelt among us, dwelt among us is not exactly a good translation. He pitched his tent in our midst. Maybe you're thinking about camping, but think more of the tabernacle when God's people were in the wilderness being led by that pillar of light during the pillar of cloud during the day and the pillar of light during the night, that the tabernacle was set up and God's presence would descend. God's presence has descended to us in a new and powerful way in Jesus our Savior and will not leave us no matter what we face. So these passages are about time, but I want us to think about time in a different way, what it's about time for us to do. We're going to do what Methodist people have done since before the beginning of the Methodist Church, these are the words of John Wesley that we'll read later in the covenant service. The covenant where we reestablish and reaffirm our faith and our commitment to Jesus Christ and his church. We're going to do that this morning as we do usually the first Sunday in any new year. But what is it time for in this world? It's time for us to roll up our sleeves and get busy. It's about time for us to take a stand in the world. Not to make a resolution, not to resolve to lose weight, because that's going to go. Those commercials for the weight loss products are going to give way again to commercials for Pizza Hut and all those other good things that we like when we lose our resolve. But we cannot lose our resolve for the work of God that is ours in Jesus Christ to be done in this community and in this congregation. 
Over the last week, I've read some very frightening statistics about young people in the church and how young people are fleeing from us in droves, not because they don't have faith in God, but because their faith in God has not been undergirded by the ministries of the church. They see us as fighting each other, as, as not taking stands against racism. It's not taking stands for the protection of our environment. They see us as weak-willed and wishy-washy. So maybe it's about time for us to really stand up, to examine our own hearts. Racism is something that needs to be done away with, and the only way it is done away with is by examining ourselves and weeding it out of our hearts through the power of grace that is ours in Jesus Christ, to let his fullness push out all that is false in us, because with his fullness we have received grace upon grace, and in his fullness we will continue to live. It's time for us to take a stand to care for our environment because God gave us the world and made us stewards. If we go back to that creation story, the man and the woman in the garden were given the dominion of all things, not so we could use it as we pleased, but so that we could care for it as God himself would care for us and care for the environment. So it's about time for us to get together again. It's about time for us to stand up for each other it's about time for us to give up old grudges and hurts. So I'm going to tell you right now what you need to do this year. I get to do that because I'm ordained and I'm your pastor. I'm going to tell you what. You need to get rid of all the malice in your heart. We all have folks who have plucked our last nerve. We have people who have hurt us desperately. It is time in the name of our Savior and in the new year to say, I will commit myself to living a life of grace and mercy and peace. There have been times throughout my ministry where I have literally gotten out my ordination vows and read them aloud to myself and repeated them to myself. I will practice a ministry of reconciling love and forgiving grace because just like anybody else, it's hard for a pastor sometimes to let go of old hurts and to be able to fully forgive others. But in this new year, if you do nothing else, I beg of you to examine your heart and let go of anything that keeps you from loving fully your brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. It's about time to start looking at the world as we look at ourselves, as we look in the mirror in the morning. We need to see in each other and in ourselves the image of our creator because we were all created in the image of God. It's about time to say no to political unrest and to political violence because it will not bring about anything but the destruction of our nation. It's about time for us to stand up and claim who we are as children of God in Jesus Christ. It's about time for us to get about the work of Christmas. This is something I read every year as I read um, on Christmas Eve the first coming poem by Madeline Lengel that I love so much. I read this every year at the end of the Christmas season. It's by Howard Thurman, the great theologian and professor. When the song of the angels is stilled and the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back in their flocks, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among people, to make music in the heart. Christ is come. Christ will never leave us. Christ will come again in the fullness of time to bring the fullness of grace upon grace to which we have been invited. I invite you now with me to reaffirm the covenant that God has made with us, that we now make with God and each other. These are the words of John Wesley written in more modern language for the day in which we live. God made a covenant with the people of Israel, calling them to be a holy nation, chosen to bear witness to his steadfast love by finding the light in the law. The covenant was renewed in Jesus Christ our Lord in his life, work, death, and resurrection. In him, all people may be set free from sin and its power and united in love and obedience. In this covenant, God promises us new life in Christ. For our part, we promise to no longer live for ourselves but for God. We meet, therefore, as generations have met before us to renew the covenant which bound them and binds us to God. Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us again accept our place within this covenant which God has made with us and with all who are called to be Christ's disciples. This means that by the help of the Holy Spirit, we accept God's purpose for us and the call to love and serve God in all our life and work. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy, others are difficult. Some bring honor, others bring reproach. 
Some are suitable to our natural inclinations and material interests. Others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves. In others, we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. Yet the power to do all these things is given to us in Christ, who strengthens us. Therefore, let us make this covenant of God our own. Let us give ourselves to him, trusting in his promises and relying on his grace. Even if you're home, I invite you now to stand as we join in the covenant. I give myself completely to you, God. Assign me to my place in your creation. Let me suffer for you. Give me the work you would have me do. Give me many tasks or have me step aside while you call others. Put me forward or humble me. Give me riches or let me live in poverty. I freely give all that I am and all that I have to you. And now, Holy God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. May this covenant I make on earth continue for all eternity. Amen.